Um, would you please all... Oh, I'm sorry. Hello? Is that better? Yeah. Would you please all join us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Pioneer Town, Steve Bardwell. Present. Yucca Mesa, Tom Ziegert. Here. Landers, Michelle C Cicero. Present. Joshua Tree, Ellen Jackman. Here. Desert Heights, Pat Flanagan, excused absence. Wonder Valley, Steve Reyes. Here. Morongo Valley, Gail Suarez. Here. Copper Mountain Mesa, Mary Helen Tuttle. Here. Johnson Valley, Jim Harvey. Here. Good. Okay. Um, on the agenda, uh, one of the directors have, has asked if we could add an item to this month's agenda, and I want to ask if the, if the other board members would like to do that or have it on next month's agenda. And that is to put... Um, uh, the um, what? Yeah, you can't once. Madam Chair, can I speak on that? Yeah, please. Um, I wasn't asking to add to the agenda under the wrong act. We can't add it to the agenda because it's not a matter of urgency. So um, I'm fine with putting it on that one. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to bring it up since you brought it up to me. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have um, any questions about the agenda? I make a move we accept the agenda. Are you? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We have no um, oh, minutes. Uh, has everyone had a chance to look at the minutes? Yes. And are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We do not have a memorial adjournment. Public safety, safety, community service reports, county fire. Hello? Hi. I am here. Good evening. No, that's not working. <laughs> okay, good evening. Can you hear me now? Uh, my name is Scott Tuttle, County Fire. Um, usually we do bunch of staff to give you a bunch of numbers of medical aids and fires we've had in each community. We have been busy. Your firefighters have been busy this past week. Um, I don't know if you paid attention to the news, but uh, we've had several fires and a uh, big rescue. So instead of going through a bunch of numbers, I thought I'd kind of detail each of those fires, kind of give you an, uh, an idea of what our guys did, and uh, just, to, just to kind of give you a little more information than just some raw numbers. Uh, so it started Thursday. Last Thursday on the 5th, we had a structure fire in Joshua Tree, 3900, 3900 block of Avenue de Del Sol. It was a travel trailer. Uh, the guys got there quickly. They uh, went into an aggressive fire attack. The, the mobile home or the travel trailer was fully involved at the time, so it was a total loss. But the firefighters stopped the fire from spreading to a nearby house, trees, and the vegetation. Uh, that fire is still under investigation. Then on Saturday morning, uh, at about 10 o'clock, we had a fire in downtown Joshua Tree, um, right in, in the building between Pipe of People and the old trading post. Um, that fire, um, again, the firefighters made an aggressive interior attack. Uh, they pushed inside. They found fire in the attic in the back of the building. They were able to contain the fire to that portion um, and save the rest of the building itself. 
And also by saving that building, they saved the building the pipe of the people is in and also the trading post. So if that, oh, yes, you're welcome. Um, so really, um, if we would have lost that building, it would have been impacted the other buildings adjacent. So that was a, that was a good save by those, those guys. Uh, that, that fire we had three engines and a ladder truck, plus the, myself, the battalion chief, and an investigator. The cause of that fire was uh, they're, they're doing some renovations. They're using a torch to do some roofing. They caught the roof sheeting on fire, which started the attic on fire. So that one was accidental. Uh, then later that afternoon, or that morning, uh, just before noon, we had a lost hiker, or an injured hiker in the Indian Canyon area of Joshua National Park. So our firefighters, who are also paramedics, uh, made access to the patient, evaluated the patient. Due to his condition and the rough terrain and the distance to get him out, we opted to call for the sheriff's air rescue. They came out and they hoisted, they lowered their medic down, hoisted the patient up, and then transported to Desert Regional. Um, then, later that evening, at about 6 p.m., we had a structure fire in Landers. So that fire, we had three engines, the battalion chief and investigator. Uh, the first engine found a house fully involved. There were reports that the person staying there had lit the house on purpose, on fire. Um, that one, we're still following up on leads and trying to determine uh, what course of action to take. Uh, our investigators are working with the county sheriff's department to, to follow up on that. Um, then, on Saturday, or yesterday, Sunday morning, at 5 a.m., we get called for a rescue for a mine rescue in a mine in that the old Dale Mining District out east of Twenty Nine Palms. So we respond out there with a fire engine and a rescue from the Marine Corps base, their heavy rescue unit. Uh, the guys get there, they find that two males in their 30s went down into the mine to explore. Um, they got way down in there. The one guy could get out. The second, the, our victim could not get himself out. Um, they literally, they would go, they were a thousand feet in this thing. And it wasn't just straight down or straight horizontal. It was you go in, you go down, you go in some more, you go down, you climb ladders. But where his final spot was where he was stuck, they had repelled down a hundred feet. Um, and then he couldn't climb the rope back up, so he was stuck there. Uh, so our rescuers, we, we ended up calling our three county fire heavy rescue units, um, plus three more engines, a squad. We brought a bunch of four-wheel drive utility uh, pickup trucks out because the access was a rocky four-wheel drive Jeep trail to get to the guy or to the mine shaft itself. So it was a long operation. We it took us 15 hours to get the guy out of the mine. So um, thankfully he was pulled out uninjured. Um, None of our firefighters were injured, so it was a successful rescue. Um, then this morning, we had a fire on Yucca Mesa, out on Yucca Mesa on Starlight Mesa Drive. Um, a residential structure fire. We had three engines, an ambulance, a battalion chief and investigator on that one. Uh, the guys found a ride to find a well-involved single-family home. Um, again, they made an aggressive attack. They, uh, the house is a total loss, but they kept it from spreading to other vehicles, the bread vegetation. Um, and that one was caused by, um, there was a grease fire in the kitchen. So, um, then as soon as we cleared that call, we get a call for a fire at Santa Fe Assisted Living. So we get there and there's smoke in the building. Um, it took us about 45 minutes to find the source of the smoke. There was just a light haze um, of smoke in the building. We evacuated all the residents, sent uh, our first two crews in to locate the seat of the fire. Um, they ended up finding it in a crawl space between the first and second floor. Um, so that one is still under investigation. But on that one, we had three engines, two ladder trucks, a battalion chief, an ambulance, and an investigator. Um, and I think that's about it for that one also. And uh, we'll see what the, what the night brings. Hopefully we're done. <laughs> I've, had, I've been here on all of these, um, and it's, it's been a long week. So.
Questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, I noticed on the Taylor Johnson fire that the hoses were run from across Highway 62 and they were running from the No, there was no fire hoses across 62. They were across Sunset. Okay, so, so there was a, the, our closest hydrant coming in was on the west side of Sunset. So we had to block off Sunset. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank yeah. you. Yes, ma'am. We can. We can. Um, usually we do cost recovery. We call it cost recovery. We do that when they do something illegal or they're negligent. So. Um, that, that's one of those things where you could argue, you know, what's negligent, um, is crawling in the mine shaft negligent. I will say, though, uh, I forgot to mention this on the mine shaft, I just want to tell people not to go in mine shafts. <laughs> it might seem obvious, but um, they're very dangerous. I mean, the, those mine shafts have been out, I don't know when the last time they were actually actively used mines out there, but it's, it's some of those mines are over 100 years old, so... Who knows how stable they are, what the air quality is in there. Luckily, this guy had good air quality, so um, you know he wasn't asphyxiated or overcome by toxic fumes um, or fall. I mean, traversing those ladders that are who knows how old. Um, yeah, there's a lot of dangers in mine shafts, so we strongly urge people to stay out of them. Another question in the back, yes. Yes, I am aware of them, and they're they're not legal for use in California. Right, yeah. They do, yeah, absolutely. They can, they can start fires. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you if you see somebody using them, um, just call us, and we'll we'll come out and we'll advise them. Um, if, it, if they just don't know, and most of the time we'll just tell them they're, they're cooperative and we'll just live with that. If they keep doing it, then we can pursue other actions, including calling law, law enforcement out. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, burning is still open. Yes, out of yucca, yes. Yep. So, yeah. any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. I'm Officer Simmons, your local public information officer at the Mongo Basin Station. Uh, since we haven't had a few MAC meetings in a while, or I missed uh, the January one due to some training, I'll go over some stats that we have from January up until the end of February. So when it comes to collisions, we had 44 collisions. Two of them were fatal. Uh, eight major injury, 11 moderate injury, and 23 non-injury. Uh, citation, citations issued up to date is approximately 1,830 citations for infractions, uh, 94 misdemeanors, uh, and boys specifically at 173 uh, infraction tickets cited. DUI arrest for this year was at 41, uh, with two of those being drug arrests. Calls for service, approximately 600 calls for service. And then just to let everybody know, on the 19th of this month, we're doing again a Start Smart class for uh, teenagers that are beginning to drive or already just gotten their driver's license along with one, at least one parent. And the class is going to be from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at our local office. So if you call the CHP station, you can talk to myself or any of the officers in there or clerical. And that's 760-366-3707. And it's all information on the graduated driver's license program along with certain techniques to use while you're driving and what they'll come across while they're on the road. Do they have any questions? Yes, 760-366-3707. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Luke Niles from the Sheriff Station. So, I'll fill you in a little bit on the numbers. Uh, I tell you repeatedly, we average about 1,800 calls per service a month. That is our standard. For some reason, uh, February went up a little bit. We were a little bit closer to 2,000 calls you know, for the shortened month of February. We're still seeing a problem with stolen vehicles and burglaries. Uh, on the good side of that, um, we've made a couple significant arrests for people who had multiple stolen vehicles in their possession. Um, actually got three of those groups during the month of February. So with any luck, that might slow some of this down going forward. Uh, but again, burglaries were up a little bit. That, that, you know, a lot of people have asked me lately, well, is that because King of the Hammers was here and we had a lot more people? Honestly, um, I can't say it was or it wasn't, but I can tell you the areas where the burglaries occurred it wasn't just out in Johnson Valley, where you would think, well, that's where a lot of people were out there, so maybe more burglaries. That wasn't the case. It spread out pretty much from Rongo all the way to Amboy. So we see that. The, the metal thefts, that's where they're starting to be an uptick in that kind of stuff. So if you have any uh, unprotected metals around your property, be cognizant of that. Don't put them near the little gray edge where people can see them because for whatever reason, they're interested in stealing that type of stuff again. Right now. Um, and then just a little public safety announcement. You know, we're expecting rains next few days, probably starting a little bit later tonight. Please, as a reminder, tell everyone you know, do not drive through or walk through running water out here. It's so dangerous. Now, even in a four-wheel drive lifted vehicle, we are not impervious to it. The water is swift and deep and it will carry you away. So, and then on a personal note, I'll speak first for Captain Newport. If you haven't heard, Captain Newport was selected to be promoted to Deputy Chief. So he will take his new position on the 28th of this month. He is going to be the Deputy Chief over our Specialized Investigation Bureau. They oversee our homicide detail, crimes against children, SWAT, aviation, volunteer forces, a whole litany of specialized investigation entities. So this will be his last experience with the Morongo Basin, because we don't have any deputy chief ranks here at the station. So we uh, all benefited from the time he spent here as a, a deputy and a corporal, a sergeant, and then as the commander of the station. So he's gone. Fortunate for me, and I hope for everyone else, I have been selected to be promoted and take his place on the 28th. So I will be the commander, effective, at the end of the month. Oh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And my replacement has yet to be named, so we'll hopefully find out in the next few weeks. But that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions for me? Yes, ma'am. Like a guide to follow for some of the victims of those burglaries. Um, it was very active. Um, and there's a lot of people in my community who are speaking about they really don't know how to find follow-up. We just kind of leave you a negative connotation. And I know that you can only use some information. So is there a guide somewhere on the website as to what victims' rights, what the expectation, how they really properly would definitely use the detectives? There are some flyers, depending on what you're a victim. The law requires certain victims of certain crimes be handed different flyers. Most that, people are yeah, most of that. That direction is services, most often. <coughs> the best I can tell anyone is um, if you've been a victim and you, you're looking for to know where the status of the case is, call the sheriff's station. Now, it gets assigned to a detective. A lot of times the detectives are already working a specific caseload, so they may be out in the field for a week at a time and not even be in the office. So please don't think because they don't call you right back. It's not that they're insensitive to your being a victim. It might simply be that they're tied up working another case in the field or they're pulled away for court. And court sometimes lasts three, four, five days a week, sometimes a month, depending on the cases. 
so they're simply just gone and out of the office. But that's why I don't want to direct anyone to call and ask for a specific person. Sometimes they actually do go on vacation too. I try to limit that the best I can, but they do. And that, that gets very discouraging for people who think, you know, hey, I want to know from Luke Niles what's going on, not knowing that Luke Niles has just been sent away for a month and a half. So if you're looking for follow-up on cases, you can call the sheriff's station and ask for the detective bureau. We have a secretary in the detective bureau that can at least direct everyone to the detective assigned to the case or to the detective that's filling in in their absence if they're gone. And that's probably the best way I can direct anyone to stay on top of what's going on. I it, to share that with you. Please do. And you alluded to something too, and it's very true. It's not, sometimes we withhold information. It's not intentional, it's not, it, it's usually, if we're withholding information, it's generally a good thing. That means we have something we know and we're working on, and we don't want that information to get out, because that's usually what will roadblock the investigations. So believe it or not, hearing that we can't say something is probably good news for the case. You can just uh, call the regular office line, 760-366-4175. And I think that goes to a telephone tree. One of the options will direct you to the detective bureau. Yes, ma'am? Um, are you involved, this is Sheriff, you're involved with your uh, traffic speed on uh, our, we do traffic enforcement. Yeah, we do traffic enforcement only in the contract cities as a primary duty. So, but that's not to say if a deputy sheriff happened to be between calls and traveling through the county area, if they saw something egregious in front of them, that they wouldn't make an enforcement stop on it. Um, depending on what they're otherwise assigned to, they would, but it is not the primary role in the county. So it, that's a bit of a misnomer, and, it, and it's not that law enforcement can't do something about it. I think where the confusion comes is when people are victimized and they know who did it and the person gets caught, they would expect that person might end up in jail. Unfortunately, that is no longer the case, depending on the value limit of the property that was taken or the value of the property that we can prove they have possession of. Most of those crimes under $950 now are misdemeanors, and they will be issued citations, and depending on how often they've been in the system, they would just get a ticket and stay in the field. They will stay out amongst people until their next court date. They will not go to jail for it. Not accurate. Yes, That's all related to Prop 47. That is a voter initiated population that passed. That is correct. That, amongst several of the other ones, AB 109 started the process, Prop 47, Prop 54, and there's a few more coming down the, from the legislators each year. Nothing else for me? All right. Thank you. Have a great night. Anyway, I'm Wayne Hamilton. Tonight I'm representing Morongo Beach and Haven. Actually, uh, I'm not going to be doing that for a long time just because the Morongo Beach and Haven is going to be phasing out. Okay, Morongo Beach and Haven is an organization that came together about 13 years ago. And what their mission was is to bring service providers together to try to do something about the homeless population and provide services for them in the Morongo Basin. 
Okay, what has happened, uh, Governor Newsom has given money to the state, different counties of the state, out um, throughout the whole state, which should be coming out. One of the stipulations for that money was that the money goes to regional entities. Okay, so um, one of the things I sit on the ICH committee, along with a member, uh, Debbie Drydock from Yucca Valley, so we're co-chairs of the East Valley Regional Steering Committee. Okay, that's a new committee that just formed on the 27th of uh, last month. And what East Valley Regional Steering Committee. Steering like your car, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that we can direct our funds. So what that's doing is we're going to be meeting the same days that uh, Haven meets. The format of Haven was that we met together, we uh, got funding for different projects, we looked at the different projects, and then we had in services by area service providers. So what we have to do is meet more formally once a month so that we can conduct the business for the money that we're going to be getting from the county, which uh, the county instructed us on forming our board, which we did. It's got 12 members, okay, six from government and six from the non-government or non-profit sector. So many of the people that ran the Haven will be on that board so that they can continue doing the work that they were doing. It's just under a different direction. Okay, so uh, our first meeting is March 17th. It's at the probation office at 10 o'clock. Oh, actually, this meeting is, is at the sportsman club on the 17th. If we're not sure of the amount of people, that's going to be starting to come to the meeting. They do what we did is the ICH, and we went and um, discussed our situation out here. We were granted $310,000, which is first of many funding resources that we're going to be able to bring to the area. So our responsibility is to get that $310,000 and take grants from local um, service providers to best fund that money in our community. Okay, so that cause the steering committee will oversee that money, make the uh, recommendations to the county, which is uh, going to be dispersing the funds on our recommendations and overseeing the use and the reporting process for the state. Yes. Integrated Council of Homelessness. Okay, there's a federal department of the ICH. Okay, every county has an ICH. And basically what's been happening over the years is the money's been going to the San Bernardino ICH and then it's dispersed through there. But a lot of times our situation up here is not reflected to their board to where they can make a decision on what they want to do. You know, it's, it's been a long time in the work of getting more funding up here and this is just something that cements what we're doing. Okay, so we'll be able to get this this pot of money, most of the money now coming down to the pike will be distributed equally by, <clears throat> not equally, what they go on is your amount of homeless count. Okay, so what they were thinking about, our money would have been $95,000 on the amount of homeless we had out here and then it was negotiated through the five chairmen of each of the region, regions, and we ended up with 310000 okay, which is, it's over a five-year grant. We could use it on one project. We could spread it out over several projects. We could spend it in a month. We could spend it in five years. Okay, but by the end of the five years, the money has to be spent. And then there's a, a deadline on when it has to be dispersed. So I think we're looking about June or July 1st of this year that the money has to be given out to the agencies or to the entity that we're going to fund. We have several projects that we're looking at. One of the things, the Navigational Center with the Fire Department up here, we're uh, looking to fund that so that we can get it up and running. Be a drop-in center where right now we have a little over, I'm thinking about $300,000 left 
of the grants that we received about six months ago for helping with housing issues up here. And we need a place to process it, do the paperwork, and enter them into the government HMIS system, which is a pretty, it's not the easiest thing to do. And we've asked for personnel from uh, the work program. So hopefully we'll get somebody out here to be able to do that for us, which will be no cost to us. The state will provide their training and put them to work for us or with us. <clears throat> Do you, do you want somebody to advise you from the steering committee? I'd be more than happy to do that. You do that. Is any of the money um, going to go toward providing small housing like we're seeing in the cities where there are actual construction of small homes or, or structures for homeless people? The money can be used for any aspect of homelessness or preventing homelessness or rapid rehousing. Okay, we can take a look at that program, see if it's something that could be integrated into the Morongo Basin. Okay, um, you know, it's just what people come to us with their ideas, and the nonprofits that are already out here will be able to um, have, have a, they can request the funding for different projects. Okay, so that's not out of the realm or scope what the money is funded for. So it could be something. The next, the board meet, the first, exactly the first regional steering committee meeting will be the 17th of this month, Thursday the 17th at 10 o'clock at the Sportsman's Club. <clears throat> How? 10 o'clock a.m., sure. It might last until 10 p.m., you never know. <clears throat> but anyway, the Sportsman's Club is right on the other side of this building. So instead of turning right at this driveway, go to the next driveway and turn in. Any other questions? We have not got the numbers back from this count. This is the first year that we conducted 100% of the count electronically. So what they have to do is, what they, we put the information in, they have the information, they just got to pinpoint down on the location of it. So that's the geo mapping of it had some glitches in it. So you know, I expect that we're going to be a higher number. Okay, it's always a challenge to find people out here and to be able to numerate them in the uh, way that we're taught to or the guidelines that set by the government. March 17th. Yeah, but it's the third. It's Thursday. Okay. Well, thank you for correcting that. So let's change that. It's the, the third Thursday, which is the 19th. Good thing I would be there for two days. So. <laughs> Yeah, good thing you showed up. Mm. But anyway, what it's doing, it, it's changing havens. The same people are going to be players. The same guideline is going to be used. We have to conduct the meeting kind of like you guys do under the Brown Act and with our agendas and stuff like that. So it's going to be a little bit more formal. However, at the end of the regional steering committee, we're going to still have the local nonprofits present and also give updates on their program as well. It's just making it a little bit more formal and getting a little bit more money. Yeah, we answer to the county again. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. you bet. <clears throat>
Thank you. Um, now we're going to a working microphone for you guys. Um, Shane Massoud from Caltrans District 8, presentation regarding the I-10 tune-up pavement rehabilitation project. This one works? Yeah? Okay. Perfect. No singing. I, it's not karaoke night for me. Well, thank you for having me. Again, my name is uh, Shane Massoud. I'm with Caltrans District 8. Um, tonight, I wanted to present some information to you on a, a pavement rehabilitation project that's taking place on Interstate 10 between uh, Beaumont at Pennsylvania Avenue all the way to State Route 111. So this is a $210 million project. Um, 116 of that is SB1 funding. Uh, it has started right now. What we are doing, or what the contractor is doing, I should say, is currently working in the center median from <coughs> H Street in Banning all the way to Main Street in Cabazon. So right now, the contractor will be taking down that center median wall that you commonly see, dividing both the eastbound and westbound directions. What will happen is the contractor will build a crossover lane in that section. The reason why he is doing that, this project will be replacing both the number three and four lanes completely. From the ground up, we'll be rebuilding those. Um, in addition, we'll be doing also the number one and two lanes. Those will see some spot treatment. So what I mean by that is we'll go through um, this 20 mile segment of pavement and in the one and two, we'll be replacing various slabs. We intend to complete this project in about two years. Um, it's a 20 mile project in total. Uh, our intent is to do the eastbound side first. So each segment that we have here on this flyer, which I hope you're able to grab up by the front, is broken up into five mile segments. So for five miles, we'll be doing that pavement rehabilitation work in that area. Um, one thing to be mindful is if you decide to utilize the crossover lane, which will be the new substitute for what we consider to be the number one lane, you will not be able to exit for five miles. You will be stuck in that crossover lane. So make sure you realize that. Um, the contractor, sure. The last sec, the, the crossover, the crossover lane will be five miles in length. That will be the new substitute for the number one lane. There will be no ability to exit. When, once you enter that crossover lane. So in this segment two that we're calling from 8th Street to Main Street or <coughs> in Cabazon, there will be a five mile crossover in that area while the contractor is working in the number three and four lanes and replacing those. Uh, there will be daytime work. All daytime work will be behind K-Rail. Uh, that will be from 6 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Uh, you will see occasional night work during those uh, night work hours as we enter into the 10, 11 o'clock hour frame. You will potentially see lane closures taking place um, on the main line. Uh, at points, the contractor has been given permission to take the 10 down all the way to one lane. Um, I brought the most recent press release for you. Um, it has the contact for the lead public information officer on, on that uh, press release. Uh, also on this flyer that I brought, there is a website for what we are calling this job. We're calling it the I-10 tune-up. There's a website. There um, also we will be uh, using utilizing Facebook and Twitter to be retweeting or I mean sharing any information about this project um, as it progresses. Um, obviously, this project is weather dependent. So as we see weather such as what's coming up this week will affect our schedule, but they are determined to finish this um, in a timely manner. So before I move on to my other announcements, does anybody have any questions regarding this project? Yes? Is the proposed in? It's winter of 2022. Oh, I missed that part. Absolutely. Well, that would be fun. You said it covers 20 miles? Correct. And these are in five miles segments? Correct. So where's the fourth? Oh, yeah, so five miles, a little bit more than five miles. It's technically approximately 17 miles, okay. the total distance, but we just rounded up to 20 for simplicity. So you, can say 17 miles? you can say 17, absolutely. <laughs> 17 miles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Will there be concrete barriers that's what's going to keep people from um, coming back into traffic for that five miles? Will they have? They'll have the, they'll have the K rail. 
a K rail on both sides? So K rail will be both on the westbound side of the I-10 and the eastbound side, encapsulating traffic in that crossover in one direction. And the other, so there'll be there'll still be four lanes open on the main line, but like I said, one of those lanes will now be utilized just in between K rail. So, so there'll be traffic going opposite ways. Correct. The K rail in between. Correct. If you're familiar with um, some a project that took place earlier last year down in Redlands, there was a crossover lane. It's going to be the same technique. Okay. So as they work on the eastbound side, we're going to work all eastbound first. And we'll utilize those same crossovers as we switch work to the westbound side. Thank you. Absolutely. So speed has been reduced from 70 miles per hour to 60 at this point in time. Yes, sir. So you folks are anticipating by moderate delays to significant delays during the construction period? Uh, that's only based on weather at this point in time. Based on what? Weather. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Are there any plans in the works to um, put the highways to two between the uh, top of the bottom grade and the top of the upper grade? The, the um, cement things that were put in between the west side and the east side uh -huh. are getting filled with sand. Okay. And all the, almost all the delineators that were up there that were helping people, especially at night, on their I can look into that. I think most part of it is it's twofold. One can be people as they hit them with their vehicles, they're getting ripped out. Also, just the natural deterioration from the sun and weather elements. Um, but I can talk to the maintenance crews and see if they have a schedule to address some of that debris buildup between that con or that center median as well as if there's any um, plans in the future to replace some of those delineators along that route. Um, that does lead me into my second... Oh, yes, ma'am, absolutely. Oh, traffic delays. I'm sorry, sir. Well, I think you could anticipate that, um, but the intention is during the daytime hours there shouldn't be because obviously we still are trying to utilize four uh, mainline lanes um, on the freeway. One of those, again, being that center median. Uh, the only time that you would see delays is during any of the night work where they have the ability to close more than just the three and four lanes what they're utilizing to uh, do repairs. So I would anticipate delays. Make sure you build in that uh, travel time as you go through that area. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Shane, I can justify that. I made quite a few trips down to um County through Redlands area with the uh, one lane, and that, that lane is kind of fun. It's like a slot car. Yeah. You can really move through it. You see people moving through 75, 80 miles an hour. Very safe with the K rails on both ends. The regular medium on one side and the K rail on the other. So it did not impede traffic as far as I can tell, even during uh, rush hour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, please please make sure you sign up for the um, at the iTunes web uh, iTunes Tune Up website for either the text message or email alerts, okay? And that will provide you the most up-to-date information with regards to any kind of closures that will be taking place during the duration of the project. Um, as she had highlighted, there is a project that will be coming to State Route 62 um, here in the near future. It is anticipated to uh, be advertised, meaning to go up for bid in September of 2020. Um, this is a pavement rehabilitation project as well. This would be uh, repaving the 62 in both directions. Uh, this is a $50 million project. Uh, like I said, lanes in both directions. It'd be upgrading the shoulders, um, as well as playing, uh, installing, ins <coughs> excuse me, installing pedestrian beacons and crosswalks in certain designated areas. I don't have what areas of those will be yet, but that is something, well, any insight would be greatly appreciated. So absolutely, you could make suggestions. Um, the areas in which this will be taking place one of the segments is going to be um, on, again, State Route 62 from Canyon Road to approximately Utah Trail in 29 Palms. Um, and the second segment, this is a, it's going to be from approximately Indian Canyon uh, Drive all the way to Yucca Mesa Road. They plan to do a pavement rehabilitation there in both directions. Um, so as that project comes to fruition, we'll be out here again. 
Yes, the, the whole the, the whole six. All the way to Yakamisa. All the way to Yakamisa, correct. So from Indian Indian Canyon Road, all the way to Yakamisa in both directions. So um, you'll be seeing that come down the pipeline. Um, as it, we get closer, we'll be back out here to present you with some more concrete information with regards to work hours and things like that. The bidding process can take um, anywhere from three to six months potentially, so we could be looking into the beginning of um, 2021. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. You can contact me uh, me directly. I can give you a card, or you can contact our public information officer. I've already use the customer service. Yes. Um, okay. So I make sure you work directly with the customer service liaison. I know that it, uh, once you submit a ticket, you are provided with the number. And so we ask that you would utilize that number to call up, follow up with that individual so they can follow up directly with the maintenance crews it's been assigned to. Um, for those who aren't aware, we do have a what we call a customer service um, platform. We call it a CSR, Customer Service Request. So you can go to csr.dot.dot.gov, um, and you can go there and you can pinpoint locations on any specific state route and put in a request for um, weed abatement, potholes. Uh, you can even do um, illegal encampment removals, anything of that nature that would be within state right of way. It gets assigned to a specific maintenance crew in the area. You get a notification via email, a service ticket, and then you kind of are able to follow that service ticket through the progress of completion. Sure, yeah, it's csr.dot.gov. Oh, excuse me, thank you. Sorry. So it's csr.dot.ca.gov. <laughs> You'll receive an email with a phone number. That you can call? Yeah, that you could call directly. Yeah, I did that twice. I need to copy Yeah, I didn't see the phone number on there. You do get a... It's on the email. Oh, you did get that. That's important. Yeah. Um, Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I just want to comment the work that was done on the Morongo Grave, filling in those cargoes. There were some huge cargoes. And now those areas are smooth, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your patience during that operation. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, chairman's report. Uh, the report that I have is that kind of um, taking a cue from the MAC, Morongo Valley CSD has changed their meeting time. It used to be on Tuesday at 7 o'clock, the third Tuesday of every month at 7. Now it's the third Wednesday at 6. So we have made it earlier for our, uh, the people in the community who were saying we were meeting too late for them. And the reason we changed it to Wednesday was because one of the board members uh, works in Indio and he just can't get back uh, on those other days. So now Morongo Valley CSD will be meeting the third Wednesday of every month at 6 p.m. at Covington Park. That's all I have. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I just have one announcement. I wanted to let you all know that Joshua Basin Water District is having its annual Water Education Day on March 29th. It's going to be from 1 to 4 p.m. at Joshua Basin Water District, which, if you're not aware, is on Cholita Road, which is just two blocks uh, north of the highway, um, just at the intersection with Park Boulevard. Um, so hope to see you all there. Um, I think this is the third or fourth year um, that they're having the event, and it's been a really big success in past years. Um, one of the highlights is always the Mojave Desert Land Trust has their um, native plant sale. And uh, there will be uh, some food and some exhibitors that will be handing out information about water conservation and lots of different things. So hope to see you all there. Thanks. Hello, Michelle Cicero from Landers. Um, I just wanted to say Saturday is the monthly membership meeting at the Landers Community Association at Belfield Hall. Um, come share your voice, meet your neighbors. 
and uh, you don't need to be a member to attend and just uh, bring up your ideas and your concerns uh, that you have. Um, they always want me to remind you that the thrift store is open Friday through and Saturday 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and on Sunday March 29th we're again hosting uh, the Landers Record Fair at Belfield Hall. Thank you. Mary Helen Tuttle, Copper Mountain Mesa Community. Um, so our kitchen renovation is moving right along. We um, hopefully the county's happy. I don't know they haven't come out yet. So. Uh, but we've got a lot going on. Uh, breakfast is still doing well. Our number was a little bit down this past Saturday, and I'm not sure it's because people got the willies about the virus. I'm not sure, but some brave souls attended. We had 62 versus our normal has been 100. So, yeah, maybe it's because I was at the desk and not Michelle. I don't know. Um, also, I want to remind you that uh, I'd like to let you know that this Saturday, the Rotary Club of Joshua Tree is going to celebrate their 40-year anniversary of serving the community. We're going to be at the Sportsman's Club. We're going to have corned beef and cabbage. And we're going to have the uh, our local desert mermaid, Dana Larson, is going to play for us. We'll have silent auction. It'll be fun. So come on out. I promise it'll be safe. Uh, Tom Ziggert from Yucca Mesa. Uh, we have our... Uh, monthly uh, gathering of uh, residents uh, on the Mesa uh, for a potluck uh, dinner on fourth Fridays and uh, at around 530 you're always welcome to come. Hi Steve Bardwell from uh, Pioneer Town. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, there is a, a house that has been a disassembled house, historic house that has been plopped by the side of the road in Pioneer, Pioneer Town, much to the uh, uh, concern of the residents in Pioneer Town. It really looks very bad. Uh, apparently this was a historic house that was moved from LA, I believe. And the fact that it's a historic house has given it a get out of jail free card with, uh, with land use services. Apparently this uh, building is going to be getting a building permit and will be made right, but in the meantime, it's very unfortunate to see such a eyesore right in the middle of Pioneer Town. Uh, I'd like to let everyone know that the county has uh, published a draft of a light trespass ordinance, a night sky ordinance, and uh, the third district dark sky committee will be meeting tomorrow, and we're going to be taking a close look at that and so we can provi provide any uh, comments to land use services to get this, uh, hopefully get this uh, ordinance passed just as soon as possible. Um, I want to also say that one thing I'm seeing a lot up in Pioneer Town is there's a tremendous amount of traffic on weekends going up and down Burns Canyon Road. And you see a lot of traffic. I mean, some of these caravans are 100 Jeeps long. And it's, can re it's really becoming a problem with some of the residents that live further up Burns Canyon. And uh, there's even been some talk about possibly trying to see if they can uh, uh, control that by either possibly even getting a gate on Burns Canyon, given that it's all on private property for the first seven miles or so as you get up out of Rimrock. So it's a, it, it is, and we see a lot of uh, off-highway vehicles, not street legal vehicles that tend to be using this, uh, using the county roads to get up to the dirt road that goes up, uh, goes up to Big Bear. So that's really something to look at. And lastly, um, this weekend there was a, 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 um, a event at Yucca Valley uh, on VOAD and COAD. This was an acronym heavy event. And uh, volunteer, voluntary organizations active after, after disaster and community organizations active after disaster. Um, the idea is to try to get people to be thinking ahead about disasters and what happens when something like that happens. Uh, who do you contact? Where do you get services? Uh, it was well attended by uh, quite a few of the organizations here, but there didn't really seem to be a real core where people could say, well, this person's in charge of 
and you would actually go and talk to this person. I t then took the opportunity to go look at Riverside County, and I see that Riverside County has a voluntary organizations active in disaster website, and they then talk about just who one would go see in the event that there was, or who the lead organization would be in the event of a disaster. And it seems to me this is something that would be good to get, uh, uh, perhaps have a little more, uh, a little more focus on with, with the help of the county. Uh, the people from the American Red Cross were there, and they were saying they have very, very few volunteers in the Red Cross. Only, I think they said, two or three volunteers. So it just started, particularly with the coronavirus now, one starts to think about these disaster type things. And so it's good to, I think, plan ahead. Uh, make sure you have what you need to be able to uh, survive after a after disaster of some sort. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Steve Reyes from Wonder Valley. Um, all I have is there will be a community cleanup on Saturday at the Wonder Valley Community Center. I'll be there at 8 o'clock, uh, 8 a.m. sharp, helping people unload things. I'm Jim Harvey at Johnson Valley, and just wanted to update that Johnson Valley Improvement Association still does their weekly breakfast on Saturday morning. So you can go to Copper Mountain, have breakfast there first, and then come over and have breakfast again in Johnson Valley. <laughs> I believe that too from what I've heard. Um, this is going to be, uh, for on March 21st, this is going to be a given because we're going to be having a swap heat in the parking lot during the entire breakfast from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. That's March 21st, that's Saturday. That's all I have. Oh, and the medical van will be there too as well. Thank you. Um, Steve Bartle, I just want to mention to you that the Morongo Basin does have CERT, the CERT organization, which is the Community Res Emergency Response Team, and people can get involved with that group um, to help in emergencies. lady that um, you were talking about with Moab, Marjorie, what's her last Marjorie name? Marjorie Smith. Smith. She's, she's been here for a big, tall lady, blonde hair. Yeah, yeah. I thought her last name was Trevor. 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 Oh, okay. Thanks. I'll, can I get them after the meeting? Okay. Um, uh, public comment, Jean McLaughlin. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's Jane then. Okay, I'm going to give these to you. On? Yes. 
All right, first of all, nobody's mentioned it tonight, but I thought it might be nice to congratulate Don Rowett being possibly legal in January. <laughs> We're actually happy with how she's helping us out at Moronga Basin, and, um, and I was happy to hear that she was reelected. So, um, The other thing is that I'm part of the co Community Affairs... Oh, shoot. Advisory. A Community of Advisory Council for Joshua Basin Water District, and we're meeting tomorrow night. Am I right or wrong? I constantly forget all these acronyms. Um, anyway, tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, at the uh, Water Board meet, uh, building, and um, it's a public meeting, and there's always lots going on about water, so I uh, invite all of you to come and attend. We get a good report from the, the new uh, manager also. Uh, pardon? No, Tuesday. Tomorrow night. CAC. Board, the board meeting is the following week. And I, I wanted, did want to mention. Hmm? Uh, right. No, that's the second Wednesday, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow night is CAC, and the following week is the board meeting. But um, uh, what did I want to say? Uh, oh, we're meeting every two months uh, as of now, so uh, we'll meet again. And uh, if you can't make it this month, come in May. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention: I'm also a senior uh, affairs commission member for the County of San Bernardino. Um, and uh, the reason I know it's the second Wednesday to, um, this week is that they're having a meeting <laughs> um, in San Bernardino. Um, anyway, they are in the midst of uh, designing their new area plan for 2020 through 2024. And I've been speaking to various groups about uh, giving input for senior uh, issues um, and disabled. Um, you don't have to be, uh, if you're disabled, you don't have to be 60 or older, but it really it concerns people who are 60 or older or disabled. Um, and I brought some forms with me if you wanted to give input. You can, uh, the deadline is March 12th, this Thursday, but uh, you can uh, submit input, um, comments or suggestions or complaints or whatever you want to add to the area plan. And, and it is a plan, so you can put anything you want to in it, and they, they will be looking into whether they can pull it off or not in those four years. But um, you can email your comments, and I have uh, information here if you're interested. Um, also, I did submit um, a couple of requests for repairs on 62, and I wanted to uh, comment how consumer friendly that website is. I thought it was very good actually, the CSR that he was mentioning. Um, the responses I got from my two complaints were designed for the area that I complained about, um, which uh, through a message, and they were two different phone numbers, <laughs> depending on who they were, the request was forwarded to. I have the, the phone numbers here. Um, so it really depends on where you see the, where you have the concern, the pothole or the, or the rough road. Um, and then I also brought, I know that we're concerned about washing our hands a lot and maybe being stuck some, at some point in a, in a um, you know, not being able to get out. And I happen to be on an a email list for Bon Appetit and they wrote up a really nice article about what to plan, what to stock up on if you're stuck at home. And I'm going to, if anybody's interested, I've got a couple of these articles. Thank you. Is there anyone else that has something they need to say? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Yes.
Thank you. And thank all you brave people that came out tonight. We thought maybe there wouldn't be almost anybody here. But it, we have almost a full board. And uh, thanks for coming. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you so much.